So you all know, "Twas the night before Christmas, right? That's one of my favorite stories. Well, now it is the Sunday after Christmas. Today's the Sunday after Christmas when all through God's house, people were decked out in crazy Christmas sweaters and maybe even a blouse somewhere. The greens were still hung in the sanctuary with care, with dread that teardown day would soon be here. That's right, we got to put it all away soon. That's sad. And the children were pumped to show off their toys while their parents had to keep reminding them, be good little girls and boys. But before we go on, we must choose a story. So up on the screen, you'll have the choice between number one, two, or three. So which will it be? Three. Three seems to be the loudest. So we're going to start with story number three this morning. This story comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 7 through 12, where we read, On the first day of the week when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep, while Paul still talked longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. Have any of you heard this story before? Were you familiar with the story of Eutychus? There's two things from this story that I feel really stand out. The first is, Paul is supposed to have a discussion at dinner time, and instead he continued to speak until midnight. Do any of you have friends like that? So long that someone listening fell asleep. It seems like Paul might not be the best dinner guest. Not only that, but after the young man falls asleep, he falls out of the window, falls down three, st- three floors, and dies, and everyone is rightly concerned, except for Paul, who simply says, quote, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And then he goes back upstairs and eats some bread and continues on in story. And I don't think Paul won this crowd over. He was very good at winning people over. But I don't know if he won this crowd over because the last verse says that even though this man was alive, they, quote, were not a little comforted. So maybe sometimes when we speak too much, we might get in God's way. The second thing to take from this story is how perfectly named is this guy, Eutychus. Because you'd have cussed too if this happened to you. Ah, laughter Sunday, one person. We needed the little padum. So that is story number three, unusual stories from the Bible. To continue on, all the moms and dads must now choose a song because we don't ever want everyone sitting for too long. But wait, did you hear all that clatter? Should we go look and see what's the matter? I think... Someone or something is here. Here, I believe it's some angels who've appeared. But are these angels harking? Or are they on the balcony so we can hear them from on high? We must choose. They're on high or are they harking? Angels on high, we will sing. Angels we have heard on high. Those angels were beautiful and had lovely voices. It's a great contrast to the commercial Xmas busyness and noises. But as the secular holiday comes to a close, the story still goes on, as only God knows. With much joy, God blesses us still, but we must pause real quick. Time for prayer and offering. But first, another song we must pick. We praise our King. 
Do we see three more kings or do we see three ships? Three ships. Will you please stand and sing? More rapid than eagles, we tossed our gifts into the plate, forgetting the blessings God has given us this date. Now Terry, now Jean, now Ella and Ben, now Mason, Mike, Barb, Linda, and Stephen. This season is about Christ who came for the big and small. We should give love and joy and spread laughter and cheer to all. But now, you get to pick another story. So we did story three, unusual stories in the Bible. So now you get to choose between one or two. Oh, that's too close. Okay, if you want one, raise your hand. If you want two, raise your hand. Oh, the ones have it. The ones have it. This is probably the most familiar of these three bizarre stories in the Bible that show that God has a sense of humor and loves laughter. This is the story of Balaam. You're familiar with Balaam? We covered it briefly in, in the story when we did it. Uh, it comes from us in Numbers chapter 22. I won't read you the whole thing because it's 35 verses, so I'll, I'll give you an abbreviation of the beginning. Balaam is, a, uh, Balaam is asked uh, by another king uh, to come and to curse these people who are plaguing his land, and these people are the Israelites. And Balaam's going to go, and he's going to curse them, and God comes to Balaam in a dream and says, don't do it. And so Balaam goes ahead and lays back down decides not to go. Well, then the people come back and they say, you know, this king says if you come and curse these people, he will give you anything that you wish. And God says, don't do it. So he tells the people, he could give me houses full of silver and gold and I still won't do it and sends them away. Well, then God comes back to him and says, you know what, if they come and get you again, go ahead and go. But do exactly as I say. Well, Balaam doesn't wait for them to come back and get him again. He's so eager that he gets up and goes, and this doesn't make God very happy. So he gets up and goes, and that just took out 21 verses. I was way quicker than reading 21 verses. So on verse 21, it says, So Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the officials of Moab. God's anger was kindled because he was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the road as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, so the donkey turned off the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the, struck the donkey to turn it back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it scraped against the wall and scraped Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck it again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey the donkey's going to talk. And the donkey said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would kill you right now. But the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I been in the habit of treating you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down, falling on his face. Then the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? I have come out as an adversary because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let it live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I did not know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now therefore, if it is displeasing to you, I will return home. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you to speak. So Balaam went on. It's a bizarre story. Balaam is a man stuck between the desires of this world, of riches, of wealth, of doing what an earthly king wants, and the desires of God. 
And he tries to please both. But he ends up failing until God makes it painfully clear to him how big of a um, donkey he is being. I think there are times in our lives where we might need to be reminded of our need to follow God. Christmas season might be one of those times where we get stuck between the desires of this world and the desires of Christ our Lord. Which are we going to celebrate in this season? I'm glad that it normally in our life doesn't get so bad that God sends an angel to redirect us and a donkey to speak to us. But I think there are times where we need that reminder of we need to get back on the path of following God and not get pulled too far into the desires of this world. But God has a humorous way of telling us that in this story, right? So that is story number one. God can work through us all and inspire us to go and try. And when we meet with an obstacle to God's love, we can testify. So out into the community, God's people, we flew with our hearts full of joy and the gospel too. But before we can go and spread God's good news, we must welcome Christ into our lives. And when we do this, do we say, O come, O come, Emmanuel, or do we say, come all ye faithful? O come, all ye faithful, faithful, or O come, O come, Emmanuel? Faithful, faithful it is. Will you please stand and sing? And then, in a twinkling, we can feel our souls, we can feel in our souls the dancing and calling of the Spirit as it grows. We can answer God's call and turn our lives around, go into the world and be kingdom bound. But look how we're dressed from our head to our feet. And crazy Christmas loaves, don't you think we should clean up and look neat? But Christ saved the world with a cross on his back. The way we look doesn't matter as long as our faiths and works don't lack. Well, you don't get to choose the last story. It's chosen for you since you've already done three and one. So, story two. Probably the least heard of story from any of you. And that is the story Wow, I keep speaking in rhyme. That was weird. (laughs) The story, too, is the story of Tobit. Anybody familiar with Tobit? This is an apocryphal book. So if you were to search for it in the Pew Bibles, you wouldn't find it. Uh, Basically, it's a very important book. And it was in the Hebrew Bible prior to the Hebrew Bible being canonized into the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. So in Jesus' time, there was a thing called the Septuagint, which if you're from Sunday school, do you remember that word, Septuagint? It's the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that was very popular at that time. In that, this book probably existed in some areas. But eventually, they organized what they wanted to, what, what Judaism wanted to have in its scriptures, and it formed the Tanakh, and it left out some books. However, the early Christian church had already started, And so, as they formed their canon, um, the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox churches, they included these books. Now, during the Protestant Reformation, Luther and other reformers said, you know, if these books aren't good enough for Judaism, they're they're not good enough for us Christians, we're built on that. And so they took them back out, which is why there's a thing called the Apocrypha, or the Deuterocanonical books. This is one of those books, and it's called Tobit. It's a 10 chapter book, and and it's a very important story, whether you want to say that it's, it's the word of God or not, that's entirely up to you and where you are in your tradition. But it was important enough that many people still read it today and are inspired by God through it. So I think it's worth, worth knowing about. And it's very unusual. So we are introduced to this man, Tobit, right at the beginning of the book, and this is what it says in the first six verses. This book tells the story of Tobit, the son of Tob- Tobiel, son of Hananiel, son of Adul, son of Gabiel, son of Raphael, son of Ragul, the descendants of Asiel of the tribe of Naphtali, who in the days of King Shalmanazir of the Assyrians was taken into, the cap- into captivity from Thisbe, which is to the south of Kadesh, Naphtali, and upper Galilee, above Asher toward the west and north of Fogor. So it tells you who he's the son of, where he lives, but the important thing is he was taken into the captivity by the Assyrians. 
And now Tobit starts writing. I, Tobit, walked in the ways of truth and righteousness all the days of my life. I performed many acts of charity for my kindred and my people who had gone with me in exile to Nineveh in the land of the Assyrians. We all know of Nineveh, right? How do we know of Nineveh? From Jonah. In the book of Jonah, God calls Jonah and says, you need to go to Nineveh and tell them they all need to repent. And Jonah doesn't want to go because Nineveh is, are the most extreme enemies of Israel at that point in time. It would be like if someone said, you need to go into the heart of Daesh and, and tell them to repent today. I don't see many of us wanting to go and do that. So we would probably go the other, other way. Jonah does the same. So that's Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. So he's still doing, doing acts of charity for his people in Nineveh. When I was in my own country in the land of Israel, while I was still a young man, the whole tribe of my ancestor, Naphtali, deserted the house of David in Jerusalem. This city had been chosen from among all the tribes of Israel, where all the tribes of Israel should offer sacrifice, and where the temple, the dwelling of God, had been consecrated and established for all generations forever. All my kindred in our ancestral house of Naphtali sacrificed to the calf that King Jeroboam of Israel had erected in Dan and on all the mountains of Galilee. But I alone went often to Jerusalem for the festivals, as it is prescribed by all of Israel by an everlasting decree. I would hurry off to Jerusalem with the first fruits of the crops and the firstlings of the flock, the tithes of the cattle, and the first shearings of the sheep. So right from the beginning we get to hear how Tobit is really faithful. So faithful that even after he ends up going to Nineveh, he's taken into captivity, he continues to worship God. And one of the ways that he did this, if we were to keep reading, is you see that he starts burying dead Israelites. Now the Israelites are outsiders, they're, they're the lowest class present in Nineveh, and often when they, were, when they died or were executed, they would just be tossed outside of the walls of the city. And he would sneak out and he would bury them properly. And he did this until a Ninevite Solomon snitched on him and told on him. And then he fled for his life. But eventually a relative of his was appointed chief of accounts in the kingdom. And he was able to intercede for Tobit with the king so that he could return home. And so he does. And it's during the festival of Pentecost. At the same time that we celebrate our festival of Pentecost. The weeks after, after Easter or the Passover. An Israelite was murdered in the marketplace. And this is where things get really interesting. In Tobit chapter 2, 7 through 10, we read, When the sun had set, I went and dug a grave and buried him. And my neighbors laughed and said, Is he still not afraid? He has already been hunted down to be put death to death for doing this. And he ran away. Yet here he is again burying the dead. That same night, I washed myself and went into my courtyard and slept by the wall of the courtyard, and my face was uncovered because of the heat. I did not know that there were sparrows on the wall. Their fresh droppings fell into my eyes and produced white films. I went to physicians to be healed, but the more they treated me with ointments, the more my vision was obscured by the white films until I became completely blind. For four years, I remained unable to see. All my kindred were sorry for me, my wife took care of me for two years. He was blinded by bird poop. You can chuckle. It's okay. I'm pretty sure God enjoys some laughter. So obviously, Tobit becomes super depressed by what just happened. And he ends up getting so depressed that his wife says, his wife was, got a gift at work and brought home this goat, and the goat starts bleeding as goats do. And he says, where did you get this goat? And she said, it was a gift from my boss because I did so well. And he's like, no, you must have stolen it. You need to take it back. And she snaps back, where are your acts of charity that you are so well known for? And at this moment, Tobit realizes that he's a changed person. He's so depressed and bitter that he's not even being nice to his wife. And so he tells God that it's better for him to be dead than to be blind. So God sends an angel, Raphael, to heal him. But before Tobit can be healed, because that would make for a short book, so before it can be healed, there's a whole journey to Medea and getting Tobit's son Tobias to marry a girl named Sarah, who also prayed to God at the exact moment that Tobit did that her life be changed because she was plagued by a demon that was killing her husband. She had been married seven times and all of her husbands were dying and this demon just kept killing her husbands. And so 
there's a whole story about getting his son there. He ends up marrying, has to cast out this demon. He takes some fish guts and some other stuff, but the demon flees. Raphael pursues it all the way to Egypt, binds it up there. Finally, Tobias returns home with his wife, and Raphael instructs him to smear some fish guts on his dad's eyes, and Tobit's sight would be restored. And we can read this in Tobit 10, verses 11 through 15. Then Tobit got up and came stumbling out through the courtyard door. Tobias went up to him with the gall of the fish in his hand, and holding him firmly, he blew into his eyes, saying, Take courage, Father. With this he applied the medicine to his eyes, and it made them smart. Next, with both his hands, he peeled off the white films from the corner of his eyes. Then Tobit saw his son and threw his arms around him, and he wept and said to him, I see you, my son, the light of my eyes. Then he said, Blessed be God, and blessed be his great name, and blessed be all his holy angels. May his holy name be blessed throughout all the ages. Though he afflicted me, he has had mercy upon me. Now I see my son, Tobias. That's a really bizarre story. We saved probably the most bizarre one for last. And yet, it's not too far-fetched. There are times in life where when we are faithful, it seems like we're still blind and even bitter. You might be thinking, how is that possible? It's where we say things like this to God. I did what you asked, but I still want it done my way. For instance... I went to church and I participated, but I still don't see why we need to do newer music. Or why we still need to do all those hymns. We think we're being faithful, but we're still blind and being demanding. So I think God still gets a good point across, even in this story that seems bizarre. That maybe even times when we think we're being faithful, we're still being pretty demanding, and God sees straight through that. But even in all of these bizarre and silly stories, God is still at work. So I think we need to reflect. Do we reflect through Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in us, or by knowing that he has come for us? Emmanuel. Will you please stand? Well, we've all seen him. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, and his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and his beard on his chin was as white as the snow, and curled up on a park bench, hungry and cold. He's where Christ is, the least of these no matter how young or old. We celebrate the infant who grew into the man and saved our entire world according to God's plan. So let us gather at his table. From the table where we just gathered and ate to the opposite ends of the world, God's reign is so great. Though the service was full of silliness and fun, remember there's still much work to be done. So maybe we shouldn't speak another word and get straight to that work. Loving and forgiving, accepting and growing into each other. Stop being jerks. If you're starting to see, lay a finger on your nose. Like in charades, this means with God we can know. The answer is before us, not behind us like Christmas Day. God is with us now and forever but one more song before we go on our way. We must proclaim God's good news either by exclaiming this joy to the world or we can go tell it on the mountains. I think that was unanimous almost. Tell it on the mountains. (laughs) Please stand. Now to end, it was, or it is the Sunday after Christmas, Now, as I hope as we leave, we all can exclaim, Happy Christmas to all, and may Christ always reign. That was a run-through, because that was not very exciting. Okay, we all read it. Okay, sight read, now we know it. I hope, now I hope as we leave, we all can exclaim, Happy Christmas to all, and may Christ always reign. Amen.